Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Camille Washington, and I am just delighted to be the moderator for tonight's conversation on Black Queer Harvard. This event is part of the Secret Court 100 series of programs. The purpose of this series is to mark the centennial of the Secret Court, to take stock of Harvard's queer century since then, and to reflect on the past, present, and future of LGBTQ plus life across the university. Tonight, we will be centering Black queer history at Harvard, as well as the experience of Black queer life at the institution. So we have three stellar panelists here with us for tonight converse, tonight's conversation. I'll quickly introduce them. Uh, the first is Arik Fleming. He is a preacher of the gospel, a scholar of religion, and a recording artist. Arik holds a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard and is the founder of Underground Church. Arik. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. <laughs> so happy to be here. We are also joined by Evelyn Hammonds, the Barbara Gutman Rosencrantz Professor of the History of Science, a professor of African and African American Studies, and a former dean of Harvard College. We are so, so happy to have you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Last, but certainly not least, I am delighted to introduce Robert Reed Farr, Professor of Studies of Women, Gender, and Sexuality, and African American and African Studies here at Harvard. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. It's an honor to be here with everyone. Great. Uh, before we get fully underway, just a few housekeeping rules. If you have any questions for our panelists during the course of our conversation, please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A function. We'll pick up on those questions in the second half of our program. I also want to encourage you to make good use of the chat function. This is really meant to be a community moment and a real conversation, so chat it up. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. Um, I'd like to kick things off first by highlighting the specific expertise of the group assembled here. Um, I think that in conversations like these, there is sometimes this tendency to forget that Black queer folks are absolutely experts on things beyond their own identity. Um, Black queer folks are not a monolith, and we all have work that we do outside of these important conversations. So I'm going to turn to the good reverend Reverend Fleming, um, you got your MDiv from the Divinity School in 2019. How did your own spirituality interact with the HDS space? And I'd also really love to hear about what you're doing now with Underground Church. Oh my God, Camille, where do I start? <laughs> um, huh, Harvard Divinity School, what a wonderful place. Okay, so let me just start um, with my background. So I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, Southern, Southerner by, 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 um, by nature, and I was raised, I'm a third generation minister. Uh, my grandfather is a pastor currently in the city. Um, I come from an enormous um, preaching legacy, so I'm third generation, and um, I grew up in this huge church context and all this love around me. Um, so many of the things that I needed as a child, I got from that community. Um, just the affirmation, the love, the respect, the attention. Um, I was the golden child. I was the pastor's grandson. I could run around and do whatever I wanted to do, and nobody would say anything to me. So I had the pleasure of doing all of that. But my context did not speak to my queerness. It could not actually speak to my queerness, nor could it help me reconcile. Um, I realized very early it, it was not an environment that particularly was, was going to grant me the tools to reconcile my queerness and my faith growing up as a minister, trying to live into these shoes that my grandfather had already kind of established for me. Um, and so it was very, very difficult living there. And then when I got to Morehouse, um, it was, you know, a little bit more free. I just, I didn't get to reconcile completely all of those uh, elements of my life. I did in some ways get to tap into some of those elements of my queerness, but not all of that was able to be reconciled while I was in Atlanta. So I think even a, a thinking about it in terms of like social location, um, I think just like just at base, my social location was not one that was able to foster my identity as a queer person. So HDS, when I got to HDS, HDS gave me the space to be free in so many different ways that I had not you know, been free before. And I, I 
I found a great respect for HDS. Um, they gave me the tools to, to do that work of reconciling my queerness with my faith. There's just not many um, um, ministers from where I'm from in my particular context, Black Baptist charismatic circles that first of all, get the freedom to be able to, to, to walk into a space like HDS and even to wrestle with these identity markers um, critically. But HDS gave me specifically that type of space to be able to wrestle with my queerness and my faith at the same time and not feel like I was being judged for it, for being on a journey spiritually, uh, because my spirituality is very, very, very much so important to me. Um, with that, I wanted to figure out a way first to continue this work um, that I was on. I felt like this was not just a moment in time, but this was a journey that I was going to be on for the rest of my life of constantly reconciling my queerness and my faith, even though society would tell me that the two don't go together. Um, and so I wanted to see if there was a way, I never intended to start a church, but COVID happened. Uh, I think we were all kind of shaken up. Everybody was just like, oh my God, what's going on? What's, what's happening? Um, I currently work with the Graduate Commons Program at Harvard University Housing, um, and I was also an administrative fellow. And so at this time, we were in seminars and we were working together, um, and then COVID happened. We all had to go home, and there was a great need from my perspective, like we weren't able to engage anymore. I couldn't walk and talk to people and, you know, engage in conversation about spirituality. I was having wonderful conversations when we were able to go outside. Couldn't do it anymore. So we found this way to do it on Zoom. And I started gathering up with a, a few of my friends and we would just, you know, sit around and talk, ask questions with each other. Um, some of them are in seminary and we, you know, would toss around these really, really heavy theological questions. And then before we knew it, it turned into church. Uh, we were we were having church all by ourselves, all in these little, these Zoom rooms, and just having a blast. And before we knew it, it became something we did every week. And then I realized this actually reminds me of of uh, the Apostle Paul uh, in the Scriptures, uh, who's writing to these um, communities of faith, who these aspiring, essentially like these people who aspire to be Jesus followers, but cannot actually be, be biologically. Uh, followers of Jesus because they're not Jewish. So Paul is writing to them uh, in secret because he knows that they, under Roman captivity, they could essentially be killed in the same way Jesus was. So he's passing out these letters, right, um, in secret and really, really trying to get the message of, of the gospel out and giving them good news. And, you know, they, they, they're, they're currently, you know, identified as oppressed people. They're not, you know, in, the, in the, the height of society. They're not, you know, the most loved people. They're not the most respected people. They're hiding, trying to save themselves from being killed by the Roman state. So I found it really synonymous with this metaphor of like hiding underground and being in a safe place underground while chaos is kind of ensuing above ground. So I think underground, the church that we've started, the virtual community of faith that we've started is actually a metaphorical representation of what it means to be able to go into a spiritual space underground or in safety and wrestle with those complexities and continue to do that work of reconciling my, especially for me, my queerness and my, and, 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 and my faith. And for so many other people reconciling all of their other identity markers, this space is one that gives us the, the ability to reconcile consistently underground while so much is going on above ground, COVID, nominations and, and elections and just, you know, Trumpism and all of this extra stuff that's going on around in the world. Underground is that safe space that we can come to engage spiritually. So that's phenomenal. I think that folks would really appreciate if you dropped a link to Underground in the, in the chat. Maybe you can do that later on. Um, but thank you for sharing that information about your journey and the incredible work that you're doing. I think it's a really important space for us all to have as queer people and as people of faith. All right. Now, Professor Hammonds, I'm coming to you. I know that you're currently working on a history of biological, medical, and anthropological uses of racial concepts in the United States. Can you tell us just a little bit more about that work and whether or not you're able to touch on the intersection of blackness with queerness or transness in that work? Well, I, after listening to Eric, I'm not sure that's the question I want to follow up on <laughs> right, in, right in this particular moment. Because uh, like Eric, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a graduate of Spelman College uh, and uh, Georgia Tech. And I came to Boston to go to graduate school first at MIT in the physics department. 
And I would say, uh, I really, uh, though we are of different ages and different eras, uh, Eric and I had similar experiences in the sense that um, there were issues that I had around my sexuality when I was growing up in Atlanta and certainly during my time at Spelman. But I was, I, I, it was clear to me that was not, I couldn't come to terms with all of that in Atlanta. So when I got off the plane to start my graduate program at MIT, the next thing I was looking for was the black feminist community because I had heard there was such a thing as black feminism. And I went in search of those folks and immediately began to connect with the people who were in the Combahee River Collective here in Boston, as well as, and, and, and that collect, and it should be understood that in this moment of second, what was, what was often called second wave feminism, Boston was really a centerpiece of that. And, and a lot of what we were working on in every field and discipline were issues of what did it mean to be a black woman in this world? What did it mean to be a black woman and a feminist in the world? What was our, what, what, what was our history? And so the other piece that is really important to that is that it was a center for discussions of, of womanist theology. And one of the people who was the leader of that was Katie Geneva Cannon. And so we were going, so I was going to meetings about womanist theology. I was going to meetings about uh, sexual assault and sexual harassment. We we're going to meetings about race and gender and ethnicity in the women's movement itself. It was a very heady time. I basically went to class every day and I was in meetings five nights a week at the Women's Center. Uh, and that's how I started my activist life as a black and, and built my identity as an African-American woman feminist uh, here in this, in, in this town of Cambridge, Massachusetts, moving from my work studies at MIT through a period of time when I was in a hiatus trying to figure out what I was gonna do next to starting my PhD program um, in history of science at Harvard. And so my work on the history uh, of, of concepts of race in science and medicine, in, there's no way not to deal with questions of gender, of course, because I'm an African-American woman, uh, lesbian feminist, the issue of intersectionality, what does gender mean? So we began in those spaces in the women's center, um, where most of the time the uh, I have to say the women of color, typically the African American women and the Latino women, would complain about the food. <laughs> we so if we have to eat hummus one more night, we're going to kill somebody. We have to have some chicken in here, some fried chicken wings. It, so we were trying to bring deal with cultural issues as well as many other issues, but. Uh, in terms of gender, gender identity and what it really meant and what it could mean were certainly at the center uh, of what we were trying to do. Though over that period of time, I would say, we didn't quite have language that pointed us toward um, what is now considered uh, queer identity, though many of us began to address that. But trans was a step further but we also were studying very seriously the history of African-American women who had questioned uh, prevailing norms about what it meant to be um, gendered. Because for much of our history as African-American women, the forces that be were trying to ungender us, trying to make sure that we, we couldn't enter the category of womanhood. But then we look at figures like, um, Lorraine Hansberry, we look at figures like uh, Polly Marshall, Marshall in particular, and her papers are at the Schlesinger Library. And for those of us who got access to those papers, we looked at the papers of a very, very prominent, significant African-American woman who raised questions about um, gender identity in ways that nobody else we knew about in African-American women's history had raised. So, of course, that's part of the work that I try to do. In fact, I'm uh, giving a, a commentary on a new book that's coming out called uh, Testosterone. Because, of course, gender identity is supposedly connected to, you know, um, 
prenatal hormone distribution, all these sort of scientific theories about that. So we're going to go in, in that discussion, we're going to go and take that stuff apart, as we should. Uh, but we also have to do it in the context of how notions of womanhood, notions of gender identity have been figured in the scientific literature about sexuality, how that has been framed with respect to African-American women. And I just give you one example. What did President Trump say in response to the um, selection of Kamala Harris as the vice president uh, nominee of the Democratic Party? He said she's nasty. I thought that was really an interesting choice of words. It speaks to older tropes. It reminded me of Sojourner Truth bearing her chest and saying, ain't I a woman? The, the, the issues of the gendering of African-American women are deeply, deeply troubling throughout American history. So yes, that is part of what I try to examine in my work. I'm sorry if that was long. It was perfect, perfect. Um, Professor Reed Farr, um, why don't you reflect a little bit on your own background and tell us about the parts of your work that you're most excited about right now? Um, thank you for having me. And, and I'm a little bit intimidated because those two um, statements that made by my, my colleagues are, are, were sort of amazing, not sort of amazing, amazing. Um, the funny thing is that we, um, apparently you've decided to have only Southerners uh, on this panel because uh, I'm in fact from Charlotte, North Carolina, which is about four hours north of Atlanta. And so I'm, um, while both Arik and Evelyn were talking, I, I was thinking they had to get out of Atlanta. Charlotteans were desperate to get to Atlanta as a place that was going to be uh, uh, more liberating than Charlotte was in, in the 70s when I was growing up here. I'll say a funny story to you about, um, uh, about being a kid in Charlotte. I also was raised, by the way, in a very traditional and um, very devout uh, Pentecostal household. Uh, and I have to say, I did not like my um, time um, in, in church. It was super homophobic, um, just shockingly so, and also super anti-woman. Um, and I don't know, uh, just as a theological thing, um, in the 1980s, there was a movement um, led by people like um, uh, Fred Price that was um, the gospel of, of plenty. And so we moved, my family moved from being um, Baptist to uh, being inside a, um, uh, a Pentecostal congregation, but that wasn't grandma's Pentecostalism. It was all about wealth and it was all about display and was hateful. It was really um, a sort of awful experience for me. Um, uh, but at the same time, I was uh, always reading a lot and mainly reading science fiction and reading um, uh, uh, romance novels, I'm ashamed to say. Uh, but I'll, the funny story I was going to tell you is that I was in something called the Tar Heel Junior Historians. People from North Carolina are called Tar Heels. And so I was in a club called the Tar Heel Junior Historians, and we had a convention uh, at uh, Meredith College, and a formerly all white segregated Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I went to the library by myself because I was the only black kid at the convention of hundreds of kids. Uh, and I knew these kids did not want me at the social. So I went to a library at the bookstore, excuse me, by myself. And um, I was looking through this bookstore and I came upon the first book I'd ever seen in my life with a black person on the cover. Um, and that was James Baldwin's um, Go Tell Little Mountain. And it had a massive um, change uh, effect on me. Um, I um, did, had, did not know one that black people could be written about in something called literature and I did not know um, that um, there were other people who had been raised Pentecostal, who were also um, really struggling with issues around sexuality, that I didn't know that there was um, people who, um, um, with roots in the South, who spoke like Southerners, who thought like Southerners, who ate like Southerners, um, that that could even, I didn't see that even in, in television in, 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 in North Carolina, much less being represented in something um, that rich and that wonderful. And so, I started to consume James Baldwin massively now um, and um, read by the time I was, this, I must have been 14 at that time. By the time I was 16, I think I'd read most of what James Baldwin had published and, and my life as effectively a literary critic um, and cultural critic was on the way. I went to college at the University of North Carolina and, um, and um, I saw a little poster that said that there was gonna be 
um, a gay students meeting um, for the Carolina Gay Association, it was called. And I joined, I was a first year student and everybody was sort of scared. And I didn't quite get the scared thing. So I ended up being elected the president of the Carolina Gay Association. My big radical thing that I did was I turned into the Carolina Gay and Lesbian Association against much uh, resistance. Um, and then um, by the time I was a junior, I knew that I was growing in all sorts of ways, but I also knew that I was the only black person in um, what we now would think of as LGBT organized in, uh, in, in down that campus. And so I don't know how I pulled it off, but I got the uh, university to pay for me to do an internship program um, at um, two uh, gay rights organizations, the Gay Rights National Lobby and the National Coalition of Black Gays. When I was there, the National Coalition of Black Gays became the National Coalition of Black Lesbians and Gays. So I'm a passive carrier of both the uh, virus that allows you to put lesbian in the title of an organization and also the uh, virus that kills off an organization as well because that's, both those organizations are now defunct. But, um, but amazingly in my life, I mean, just a thing that happened to me was that um, I came into contact, in fact, with members of the Kumbahi River Collective because of being involved in that organization. I came into intimate contact with um, the grand poet Essex Simple, the grand poet Asato Saint, um, and people who were doing things that I could not have imagined. This is how we're talking, 1985, 1986. I could not have imagined that, oh, that that was possible for anyone to even think those thoughts or to combine those things together. Uh, and those were the people who, interestingly enough, who encouraged me to go to graduate school. So you don't think, oh, a gay and lesbian, a black gay and lesbian organization is going to tell some kid from North Carolina go to graduate school at Yale, but that is exactly what they told me to do. Um, and those were exactly the people who were nurturing and kind and sort of wonderful to me as I did a sort of kid brother um, thing with them. Um, Camille, I'll just say that um, I think you know now that I'm trying to write something like a biography of James Baldwin because the James Baldwin papers in fact came open um, in, uh, 2016 at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and there was also a big cache of papers at the Bionic Library at Yale. Um, and some of that has to do, a lot of that has to do with, uh, in fact, my identity. I'm a black person, I'm a gay person, I'm uh, a person uh, who was raised in a certain religious tradition, um, a writer and, and something like an intellectual. Um, but also it has to do with the fact that I think that uh, one of the things that really concerns me about um, all of those communities that I've just named is that we are, um, we are people who are yearning for an understanding of our past and yearning for an understanding of our history and yearning for understanding of how it is that we exist in the world. And golly, we have an opportunity with this particular archive. It's huge and it's rich. You know, we have the opportunity to um, at least get in there and mess it up. You know, so my sense about how to, how to, how to work with it is to just get my hands dirty. I, I, if I fail, if I fail, if I write a bad book, I'm not trying to write a bad book, but if I write a bad book, at least it means that, you know, you give people access to um, documents often incredible um, that they wouldn't have had access to uh, before. So if I fail personally and, and don't get all of the, uh, the praise that I would like to get, um, I nonetheless win because um, that thing, that, that, um, that bringing these materials into a more public view is a massive win for all of us. It really is. And, uh, and I'm, I feel privileged to be able to be able to do that. Oh my gosh, you have just set us up perfectly for the next part of our conversation, which is all about history and why it matters and why our history matters, why black queer history matters. Um, so when I was coming up, with questions for this event. I was like, you know, let me think. Black queer folks at Harvard, who do I know? My mind immediately went to Alain Locke, whose portrait was used in the promotional materials for this event. Uh, for those that may not know um, Alain Locke, he got his second bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, from Harvard in 1907. Um, he was PBK when he was here. He came back to Harvard for his PhD in philosophy, which he received in 1918. And he's best known today as a kind of philosophical father to the Harlem Renaissance. Now, I am sorry to say that my knowledge of black queer history at Harvard kind of ends there. 
so I guess what I'm asking is, I would like it, I would like you all to reflect on the history of black queer folks at Harvard and in academia more generally. So what history, what intellectual lineage comes to mind for you? You've already started to touch on these things. Um, but how can we remember a history of black queer Harvard, which we cannot access in its entirety because it has not been valued in the same way as other histories of Harvard? And you know, if honoring black queer history at Harvard or in general is an act a revolution in a system which neglects black, queer, and trans people, then how can we reimagine what history must be? Um, if I might, as the, I hate to call myself elder, whatever, a person who maybe has been at Harvard longer than Eric and, and Robert, I would say that one of the aspects of queer history at Harvard is the way in which is, as an institution, long a male bastion, as you all recall, male bastion where uh, I would say the presence of queer people has been uh, made rendered invisible in the history of Harvard for a very long time. There are many histories that have been written about Harvard in many different ways. Um, and uh, our good friend and colleague of Roberts and I, uh, uh, Michael Bronsky is someone who is really sort of probing these kinds of historical narratives. But uh, at Harvard, I, I would, I would I would suspect that there's been a long history of queer people at Harvard, but, but, constrained, but how we know it is constrained by issues of class. In other words, people had a lot of money. Uh, many of the men who went to Harvard for most of Harvard's history uh, who were queer could, ex could express their queer identity many times outside of the formal structures of Harvard. And so that, I think, complicates the history. And we need a better history, because we don't know as much about the women, uh, certainly that what was happening at, at, at Radcliffe. Uh, and some of these were the sisters and sisters of some of the men. So it's, a, it's, a, it's white, it's classed, it's elitist. It, it, it depends on understanding some of those issues as they played themselves out at Harvard. So let's just jump forward to the, to the 70s and 80s. I would say that there also probably have been lots of stories that we still do not know of African-American men and women who were queer and had to find their way through the interstices of Harvard um, and not uh, in any kind of public recognition. When I came to Harvard to do my PhD, I was already out. I had already named myself as out and a lesbian, um, and a lesbian feminist. And frankly, it wasn't an issue. It wasn't an issue. I didn't experience it as an issue, uh, except when I was about to take my exams for my PhD, somebody said, uh, you know you're going to fail. And I said, what are you talking about? Why am I going to fail? Well, you know, you, read, you wear those red cowboy boots and you have dreadlocks. I'm like, uh, yeah, so they're going to fail you. And I said, if they fail me for that, then I don't even really care. <laughs> I don't care because I don't want to be in that club. If that's what I'm going to get, that's what I'm going to get, uh, you know, hit with. Um, and so it was a particular moment where feminine, certainly the feminism had made some inroads into Harvard that made, that made a space for me and actually uh, for white lesbian feminists to provide a kind of um, space for me to, uh, to do what I needed to do to earn my PhD and do my work. Also at MIT, when I, when I, I finished my PhD at Harvard, I go to MIT, back to MIT, and MIT, same thing, because it was the, it's the context of Cambridge and this part of the women's movement that was opening up all these questions in ways that were making it possible for those of us to come through. But for an African-American woman, it's always what's hitting you hardest, race or gender or sexuality. On a given day, you have no idea. But I would say that I can't truly say that there were moments where the fact that I was um, a lesbian was front and center in what was happening to me. I would say race, race, class, and race and class and gender were playing a really more significant role 
um, and most people, uh, and, and the ways in which white male elites who run Harvard um, were running Harvard. Um, I wasn't a threat to them. Other people of color were not threats to them. They had, they had control over limitations of our presence, of our voice and our visibility. So um, I think it took another period, another 10, 15 years post the 80s into the 90s, now into the 2000s. Uh, when I was Dean of Harvard College, one of the things I really am very proud of is to giving support to LGBTQ issues in the college. And I just said, if I walk out of this door tomorrow, I want to say that I tried to make a difference and I did make a difference both in space and visibility and acceptance. And every time my little guy was running around the Dean's office saying, my mom's in charge of everything here. Um, and people were going, yes, that's true. Then I felt like I had made some kind of difference. But the difference also came because many people in administration like President Faust, who also ha who has a daughter who's a lesbian, uh, the barriers were coming down in ways that made it possible for us to make some moves if we were prepared to make them. But the, diff the difficult part is, I think, for Camille and Eric and Robert is that it's never talked about. It's never talked about. And that, to me, that sort of keeping in a sort of a closed box is, is really problematic. As gay, gay and lesbian alumni gather together at every commencement, they're providing funding for the, for the chairs uh, that we now have. They uh, express themselves. We had the first uh, lesbian couple as housemasters with Dorothy, uh, uh, Diana Act and Dorothy Austin. And yet, nobody talks about it. So it's that silence part of it that still deeply troubles me. And I feel, I feel that it probably makes it difficult for a freshman who shows up and doesn't know anything about any of these things I just talked about. And nobody else around them knows anything about those things. So there's a particular peculiar kind of silence at Harvard, which some people see as acceptance, but I see as silence and an inability to deal with, with queer issues. So done with that. Um, if I may, um, Camille, um, Evelyn has come out as the, um, the person who's been at Harvard the, um, the longest who's on this panel. I'll come out as perhaps the grouchiest person on this panel um, because uh, the thing I'm going to say about it is, look, there are massive um, obstacles to um, unveiling what we might think of as queer or LGBT, black queer um, LGBTQ history at Harvard. Uh, but there's exactly one answer to that, and that's get out there and get started. If you want to know what is going on, Harvard also happens to be, have the largest um, private library on the planet, some of the most massive um, archival holdings on the planet, um, and what is, uh, and also a bunch of people around who uh, have real knowledge of, uh, of things that have and have not happened on, and, at this place. And a lot of the information that people are looking for is in fact um, hidden in plain sight. For example, an easy thing um, is that uh, specifically to say about um, your Elaine Locke reference, um, the Polk County Cullen is also um, a Harvard um, graduate and while County Cullen was um, in Boston, he um, became um, close friends with Buford Delaney, Buford Delaney, the modernist painter who was in fact um, probably the first real mentor of James Baldwin along with County Cullen. That information is widely known if you read about it. And that information about um, many individuals is actually available if you get your hands dirty with um, and do a little bit of old fashioned work um, and, and get going with it. Um, the, the other part of it, the grouchy part is now done. The other part of it, I would say, is that I'm not sure, actually, a little bit, um, Camille, about your use of the word queer, because I think at Harvard you can actually find histories of um, exceptional persons um, who um, went on to have exceptional lives uh, because of having been associated with Harvard. Um, but I think that there is also a history that is not simply about the students, it's not simply about the faculty, but it's also about the staff, and it's also about the ways in which Harvard is integrated into um, the city of Boston, into this region. 
Uh, and so the, I think the theoretical and the ethical thing for me is how do you actually get to the actual queers, the people who don't easily fit in boxes that said, okay, this is a generally sort of proud gay man who has gone on to do X, Y, and Z in his life. Um, how do you actually get to those people? Most of, most of the people who are, we would think of as sexual minorities or however you want to say it, gender minorities, um, in fact, probably were not that dude. Um, uh, they probably didn't fit into that thing. So the question is how you can actually get your finger on or get close to what those individuals' realities were um, and what is the conceptual work and the theoretical work and also the archival work, frankly, that you can, you can go around with. I have mentioned before that we have here the papers of um, Paula Marshall. Uh, I think that if you're black or anything else, by the way, at Harvard and you're not um, beating down the door to go and read the papers of Paula Marshall, then shame on you. I mean, really shame on you. Um, and, the, um, and the other unbelievably rich um, materials at the um, premier uh, archive of, of women's history in the world at the Schlesinger, that, then shame on you. That part of what we have to do is in this very, very difficult time is to not be passive. Um, and we have to say, look, we, we, the odds are stacked against us and therefore we gotta do some extra work in order to get it done. We gotta, get, um, gotta knock on even more doors. We've gotta move forward. Um, and so I would encourage people to not feel like, oh, okay, there are no answers available before you actually even start to ask the question. Just really, really quickly, I, so I, I saw this in the chat and this was already like on my mind before, but um, one person in particular that I just kind of want to raise uh, in the room um, is Peter Gomes. And the reason um, I'm raising Peter Gomes is, in particular is because, um, first off, I, I, most of my time at Harvard was spent at the Memorial Church. However, I did not get to meet Peter Gomes before he passed. Um, and so this kind of representative queer person who is also kind of like at some, at, at a very high, um, on a very high pedestal at Harvard, but also black and also vocally queer. Um, and even in the way that like, what I've read about him, what I've heard, um, how he presented his queerness was very unique. Um, and so I think it's very interesting to think about Harvard's history uh, in relationship to the, to white males who are queer and blackness entering the space and that, of course, there's not a there's there there are there are very few uh, things that kind of overlap between those two identities. If you're black and queer at Harvard, your blackness is first the problem, um, and then you have to deal with all of the other elements. I even I've even come to think to some degree that Harvard did a better job at accepting my queerness than even my blackness. That I had to deal with that that Harvard gave me the tools to wrestle with my black that with with my queerness before even reckon, helping me to reconcile what it meant to be black in this space um, but the reason this is so interesting is because Harvard's beginnings kind of start as an institution to train ministers and then also right so I come in I'm at the nexus of both I'm I'm a minister and also queer which you know these two things kind of repel so um, I think in order to, 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 to tie in what both uh, Professor Hammonds has said and also uh, Professor Reefar has said, um, just about digging into the history and actually telling it, going out of the way to get into the history and telling it because if we don't tell it, no one else will. I just want to add one point. It, it was remiss of me not to mention the Peter, Peter Gomes issue. When Peter came out, it was a major event at Harvard. And again, there's a lot of silence around um, what happened, the backstory, the outrage of major donors, administrators, all kinds of things happened. And we still don't have a very good accounting of how it happened, how it was reconciled, and Peter kept his job as the uh, uh, plumber professor of, 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 of um, in the divinity school that came with being the head of Memorial Church. There was a, there's a lot, a lot, a lot there. And uh, maybe it's some of you listening right now who were present when there was a big public discussion when he came out. Many of you will remember, maybe many of you can go back into the Crimson Archives and see how it was reported upon, how it was, it was a national story. And yet again, we don't talk about it. <laughs> as if it, it sort of glossed over as if, you know, Peter came out and everything was all well, was, all was well with the world. That is not what happened. 
And um, it was a very fraught moment. There needs to be a lot more discussion. Why do we need more discussion? Not because of Peter himself, though that's sincerely and, and significantly important, but because every freshman year, there's a kid who comes in who's struggling, who's queer, who's black, who's of color in many ways, and feels like, how am I gonna be here without any, any anchor that can be grabbed to say, well, there are a lot of people before me, but a lot of people like me before me that were able to be here and succeed. And so that's what we need the story for. But also I think there needs to be a serious reckoning around what happened to Peter and the Harvard community's response to uh, his coming out. Oh my goodness. This this conversation is just phenomenal. Um, in, in terms of reckoning with the history, I think some of that work we're trying to do via this Secret Court 100 series of events. And we are planning on launching a podcast about the queer history of Harvard. And so it sounds to me like there is a lot here um, that we could really use to educate folks and start to build this history um, and sort of elevate and unearth this history that has been hidden um, and gone unspoken for too long. And I really appreciate everyone's comments about how you relate to this institutional space. I have been a member of the Harvard community since 2006. I went to Harvard College. I was, you know, first generation college student. Um, then I became a staff member and I had the alumni relationship. And now I am both a staff member and an alum and a current graduate student. Um, so as you can imagine, my relationship with the institution has really evolved over the years and has only ever been made more complex, primarily because of my blackness and my womanness, um, but also because of my queerness. Um, so I wonder if any of you would be willing to reflect a bit more about your own relationship to the institution. Um, and as a person who is interested in making Harvard as accessible, as radically inclusive as possible, you know, how, what strategies can we use to make that change? And how does Harvard compare with other institutions that you have experienced? Well, Camille, thanks. That's, that's not a softball question. <laughs> um, uh, I'll just say that in, on this panel, I think that I'm the, um, I'm the junior person, truly, in this sense, and that um, I only arrived at Harvard in uh, 2018, in fall of 2018. Um, I arrived also in a very peculiar way in that I became the first person, the first tenured person in studies of women, gender, and sexuality at Harvard. Um, and um, um, studies of women, gender, and sexuality is in fact a committee and not a department. So, but it's been around for decades. So, um, uh, um, uh, my appointment um, and uh, other things that have been done, um, and the grand work that has been done, and that has been um, a long time coming, and has involved the work of a lot of people um, other than me, as a matter of fact. So, I'm happy about it, and I think that that is a positive and good thing uh, in relation to Harvard. But I also think that. Obviously, we need to have um, continued diversification of the faculty and continued diversification of the, all of the communities, all of the constituents of the institution. I'll say personally, to just get to, the, uh, to part of the gist of what you have said, uh, is that uh, I said to my friends when I was deciding to come to Harvard from my very fine job in New York City uh, that I liked and where I had prospered, um, that part of the reason I decided to come to Harvard was that I was expecting to come to Harvard and be very comfortably marginal uh, and was perfectly happy to have that happen. Uh, and I thought, oh, well, oh, you know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Is this a secret? Uh, and that was the plan. And it's totally not worked out. It is totally not worked out. Um, and that has been very pleasantly surprising to me. I'm now going to... Uh, shockingly say nice things about Harvard, it may not happen again, so enjoy it. Uh, that 
in fact, the reception of me, I wrote a book called Black Gay Man, right on my CV. Um, you know, the reception um, of, uh, of me has been really quite fine. Uh, my classes are full. Um, the things that I have asked for, I have got more or less gotten, um, and I have prospered at the institution. Um, and so I cannot report outside of the institution that, oh my gosh, this is such a horrible place. I know many of the problems at Harvard, and I have a, a very, very secret, serious critique of the place, but it has not been uncomfortable for me personally. I have, I taught for many years at, uh, for some years at Johns Hopkins, um, and the reception of, when I got to Johns Hopkins, there were two African-American persons on the faculty. The other African-American person was Ben Carson. And so when, um, and this was 1994. Um, and so um, when I came to Harvard, the fact that there is a Department of African-American Studies, lots of very interesting black folks were all going around, lots of um, other LGBTQ people on the campus, actively on the campus was refreshing to me. Um, I think though that we are in a moment of change. Um, and that my life experience is that things go in cycles. So my sense of um, being a gay man at Harvard in 2020, and my sense of being a black person at Harvard in 2020, and being a progressive person, a progressive intellectual in 2020, is that we'd better um, strike while the, uh, I never get these things right. The fire is hot or the iron, something striking something while it's, while it's hot that we'd better get with it. Because I think that we have um, all of us, and I mean, I mean everybody, all of us have some opportunities because of the crisis and, or in spite of the crisis, crises, um, uh, to move the institution forward in ways that the institution has not yet imagined and that, not, um, and that I think we owe it to people who came before us um, and who did work to lay the ground for us, whether or not that work was heralded or not, to be m even more hard-nosed, dogged, creative, and direct in what we're doing. So I don't, I don't as a faculty member, regularly face um, types of ugliness that I've faced in a lot in my career at Harvard. I'm, I'm pleased about that. But I do know that there are structural problems at the institution, grand structural problems at the institution that it is time for us to deal with. And I'm gonna say just bluntly, particularly around um, um, the diversification of the, uh, of the curriculum, um, the diversification of the faculty, shocking resistant to, resistance to um, modes of thought and, um, and disciplinary change that has happened in much of the rest of the country, um, that if we want to, uh, if we are going to embrace the institution, we've got, to, we've got to shake the institution a little bit, because if you care about Harvard, um, then you cannot let this place just be a stuffy and more of a place. Right now, it's in a good way, but you can see real resistance to change at the institution that's not just about um, um, political conservatism or bigotry. It's about the sense of Harvard's sense of itself as being a place that should not uh, change very quickly that affects particularly people of color, um, gender and sexual minorities, working class people, immigrants who are, who the, the gift is, why don't you come and be part of the location that you change instead of having the institution change. And I think we've got to drastically figure out how to change that, change that narrative. So I'm not going to say nasty things about Harvard but I will say that you know, um, if you're going to commit to the place you need to commit to, it's, it's growth and figure out how to, how to make that happen. Figure out how you can uh, join with other folks to make that happen. I would say that I agree with everything Robert just said, but, but, and I would add one more thing. One of the things that I find uh, continually to be unsettling for me at Harvard is that people of color, um, and the incredible increasing diversity of the Harvard undergraduate population, um, still something called the crimson, uh, which is often understood by administrators and people out in the world because it's on the internet as the voice of Harvard. But yet it is a profoundly undiverse voice. And when I was Dean, I would often say to the Association of Black Harvard Women, why don't I hear you guys complain? Why don't I hear you guys critiquing what is in the Crimson 
that is being said about black people or African-American women. What, what is this silence about? Stop it. You need to speak up. You've been here for, we have, we have, those of us who came before you have made it possible for you to be here and you own it and you are here and you don't have to apologize to anybody. I want to hear more. I want to hear more. I want to hear more diverse voices, critiquing, questioning, pushing particular positions to the administration through that particular vehicle. And there are other vehicles that should be used as well. I, I, and, and so I think that, and the way that affects me is, is a sense that not just queer folks of color at Harvard, but many people of color at Harvard don't feel they own this place. I'm telling you, I don't feel that anymore. Maybe it, take, it took a long time, but I don't feel that. But, but I want younger folks to own that as well. You own this place. You've been paid for. You have a right to critique and criticize and, and try to make it be the institution that you hoped for or had aspirations for when you first arrived. We can do this. But the silence that we play around with is not helpful at all. And so uh, if I can get uh, my one hot button through all of this is to say, make noise, speak up, criticize, critique, hold them accountable because it is your institution. It is your institution. The, the people who started it and the, their descendants, they don't question that. They feel they, their, their ownership is like totally settled. Well, our ownership is settled too. And we need to act upon that. I completely agree with everything. Um, and I'm adding on this from an experience, from, from experiences as a proctor for freshmen when I, I served as a proctor for two years. Um, and so I got to see a lot of the, um, the insecurity that a lot of students bring into Harvard uh, firsthand. I mean, I lived with students and I got to really see um, a lot of students didn't know that they had the, the capacity to hold Harvard accountable. Um, and I think with that permission, students are able to move forward into the institution and actually challenge the systems that are there that are constantly kind of oppressing and repressing and kind of keeping them um, contained because right like we come in with this imposter syndrome and the thought that oh you know what i'm just going to take everything because i'm grateful just to be here when it's when the reality is the, the same way du bois said i'm probably going to misquote it but you know it was harvard's it, it was it was it was Harvard's benefit. It was to Harvard's benefit to have me here, right? Like I didn't, I didn't get from Harvard. Harvard was blessed to have me. And I think to have that perspective coming in as a student, you would understand, right? Like if Harvard is blessed to have me, then that means my voice, my activism, my response, my critique, my, um, my level of accountability for the institution. Um, I, I take that seriously enough to make sure that whoever else comes behind me does not have to deal with the same stuff that I had to deal with coming in. Oh, speaking to my heart, Ark, speaking to my heart. I um, advised freshmen for several years. Um, and part of why I felt the need to do that was because when I came here as a, a closeted black first gen woman, I didn't feel understood by any of the advisors that were given to me. And it really had a, had a profoundly negative impact on the experience that I had. I think I felt alienated from the space. Um, and I, I think I felt a lot of that imposter syndrome. And I think now that I am, you know, having my, my second chance at being a student here, I'm, we gotta leave all that behind. This, this is our space. Um, and it's interesting to be having this conversation during this time, right? I mean, in a meeting earlier this summer, I heard very senior leaders at the university say that Black Lives Matter. Now, when I heard that, I thought, okay, well, that's nice, I guess, but what does that really mean within this context, you know? And so what I want to see is some actual progress towards that goal, right? Like, what would it take for Black queer lives to matter here? Lives of, lives of color to happen here. Um, and what are the contributions that we as a community um, should be expecting from the administration? And what are the contributions that we can make ourselves? I say that just as a 
provocation, a little food for thought. But I want to make sure that we get to some of the audience questions. Um, so this first question, it was submitted to us via email. Um, now, the transition to online learning and community is one that everyone is grappling with. Um, do any of the panelists have ideas about the ways in which we can support our Black queer students online during this time? So this is my life. <laughs> um, I am a virtual programmer, uh, program manager for the graduate conference program. Um, and the reason is because we would usually be doing in-person programming, but now we're doing everything online. So I've gotten used to Zoom. I know all of the different, you know, things. Now, yes, Zoom fatigue is real and people are going to get tired of Zoom. I understand that. However, one of the things that we've been strategizing to do is to create these virtual kind of common spaces uh, because we have in-person common spaces, but now we actually want to take on this responsibility of creating virtual common spaces where people at least get a sense that that community is still present. Um, I think if we allow it, COVID can like ruin all of us and our perspective on where we are and what opportunities we actually have available to us. Um, if, we, if we actually think critically and, and maybe even just take seriously the opportunities that we have with the resources that Harvard has, um, there is just an, a, a world of opportunity resources um, that Harvard can, can tap into and allow its students to tap into, uh, to connect and to stay virtual. Um, and I'll say like from a generational perspective, we ain't that far off from the internet. You know, we, we, we love social media and we love all of the different, you know, trinkets and different things. So, you know, although we'll complain about the Zoom fatigue, we'll, I think, I think, I think we can handle kind of doing a virtual, a virtual thing. And let's, let's just kind of take this opportunity while we have it. Like, like uh, Professor Reefar said, let's, let's maximize this opportunity um, not necessarily like downplaying where we are and, and, and sobbing about it, but actually realizing that there's a whole opportunity here to establish um, maybe even a, an, an entire virtual network, uh, which is what we're, shameless plug, trying to do with Underground, right? Like this, this taking the opportunity to establish this virtual network so that people still recognize that they have resources available to them to move forward. So for me, I find it challenging uh, I'd very much rather, uh, I, I'm still in, in grief mode of being able to be with you all in person. Uh, but I do, be, I am beginning to see there is value in trying to, uh, in, in fact, just seeing your faces and hearing your voices and experiencing all the different feelings I'm having in this conversation. And so I think the issue is how we can continue to connect uh, and feel connected with one another. Um, you know, my 17 year old son complains that I have no idea what's happening here. And he's probably right. Uh, but in the last few weeks, I've actually begun to feel more hopeful uh, that we can create community in this way. It's not the same kind of community that I am more familiar with, but I'm not really, I'm not as pessimistic about it as I was probably in the last uh, couple of months. I think for me, had to get over the fact that I can't see you, can't sit down in the science center somewhere in the square and, and chat with you all. Um, but then again, those physical spaces was getting harder and harder to manage getting there. So this is actually a way in which I'm at home, uh, I can watch the clock and make sure that I don't burn the salmon and still have a conversation uh, with you all. So um, I do think there's value, but I think the most important part of it is value and connection. I think one of the things we're going to, um, I know that the, the faculty is having to come into to understand how to do this, is because of remote um, teaching, um, you have to now be thinking about having um, your people in your class who are in fact in uh, very far distant, physically distant from each other. Um, but that also opens a possibility for people who are interested in doing certain types of organizing. I just want to say that I'm, um, I'm involved with um, something called the African Atlantic Research Group. Um, basically people from um, working in the United States and in Germany who are working on the African diaspora. I also was, before I came to Harvard, the director of um, an institute of, uh, for research in the African uh, diaspora. So one of the things you can do, and I've done this now in a couple of different meetings, is been in meetings and um, begun working on projects um, with people doing LGBTQ organizing um, on the African continent and in Europe. 
And so why don't we use um, this not simply as a technology, the technologies that we're now all becoming expert with, as not simply a stopgap and something that we are forced to do, but I wonder if we can imagine how we're gonna use it after this particular crisis to do the connecting, the international and global uh, connecting um, with other um, people of color, other uh, uh, members of LGBTQI um, communities um, and figure out how we can actually use this technology to um, get past a little bit of the provincialism that particularly American people have, and that, inc and that includes African-American people, um, and figure out how we can actually learn from experiences of other people who are doing the type of work and doing the um, cultural work and scientific work, um, social work that, um, that we, we say that's really important to us, but that often we're really ignorant about. So um, there are, I see a bunch of uh, little initiatives like that cropping up um, in which, you know, all of a sudden realize, why can't I be in conversation with the bunches of people doing black LGBTQ organizing in South Africa? Why, why is that? Why is that such a big deal? All of us have, everyone who is listening now and everyone who is on this uh, panel has that technology right now, right now. We can start doing that tomorrow, this afternoon. And so I think we have to get out of a defensive posture and start figuring out, okay, what about this do we lack? And how can we hold on to it for, uh, for the long term and do some things that um, there are people who would underestimate uh, us don't imagine that we have the, the cleverness to do. I completely agree. Excellent. Um, sort of on that same tack, we have another audience question. Um, with regards to Professor Hammond's point on silence regarding queer and black queer issues at Harvard, who should work towards breaking the silence and how should it be done? I ask this as a student at Harvard who has had queer teachers and proctors who have never openly spoken about their queer identity in class or in meetings. Oh boy, I, you know, I, I am perplexed by this. Um, because it suggests that structurally uh, there's still a lot of people who don't feel safe to own their the, own the space to the extent that they feel comfortable speaking out and um i i would i would like to see more speaking out but i also like us to come together and talk about what are some of the what are some of the actual barriers that are making it hard for people to do so um is it uh, you know is there fear of retribution is there fear of, of 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 that they won't be evaluated properly what what kinds of things are happening because i, I am i am if we can't name it we can't fix it and so i think there's a sufficient um support in the administration and i could be wrong because i, I know i'm wrong because if people felt okay they would be saying it and some reason they're not. And so uh, I think we have to do this. I think we have to, and I think we have to use this crisis as a moment to try to figure out what it is. What sets of things will make it hard for people to speak out? Um, and, and, and I don't use my own personal story as one that suggests that everybody has to do what I did. When I, when I was, uh, when I came to Harvard, I was older, I was mature, I was clear about my identity issues. And every day I realized there could be a moment when I might have to say something and confront something that would cost me the privilege that I was slowly but surely gaining. But then I would always say to myself, I'll take the civil service exam and get a job at the post office. And I said that to my friends all the time. Uh, think about how fraught that is in this particular moment. But, you know, I felt like I'm not going to, there are things I'm not going to accept at this point and that's 20 something years ago, if not longer, and I won't accept them now. So, but, but why don't a lot of other people feel that? I think we all need to get together. We, we need a convening. Eric needs to open that convening. We need a convening to talk, we need a convening. And we need to put all this stuff out on the table. I really feel strongly about that. 
and we need to get to the heart of the matter. There's a lot of alums who have a lot to say over the course of their time. There are current people who have a lot to say, and we need to get to it. Let's just get to it. I even want to add, um, it, it should not take us a hundred years to have this, right? Like this in and of itself is an example of like, of what Professor Hammond is talking about, right? Like it's taken us this long to have this conversation. So uh, like how many more conversations are stacked up waiting for us to have? Um, and yes, I, I am all for having that convening. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> I'm ready. It's church. Let's have some church. Fantastic. I'm down for this convening as well. We'll, we'll start the email thread right after this. Um, so another question. Um, this panel is part of our reflections on the centennial of the homophobic secret court of 1920, which is an event involving white man perpetrators and white man victims, though the gender question is worth discussing here. How can we, in our effort to recognize this event and advocate for queer students today, best recognize, celebrate, center the histories and experiences of non-white LGBTQ folks in this effort? Uh, I'm gonna do my professor thing. It's the wrong oh, question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a great question, but exactly the wrong question. Um, and the reason that it's the wrong question is because uh, uh, I'm lickety split smart and the three of you, Camille, Arik, and Evelyn, are, are geniuses. Um, but none of us as this group has the answer to that question. Um, what we can do is figure out process to get answers to that question because there is no single answer to that question. But, the, um, uh, but again, it's, um, uh, it's that we need to have multiple people involved in a conversation that, that begins to deal with that and begins to set up structures for how to address that and begins to stretch, set up uh, ways to move forward on those, types of, on those types of issues. We can, because the only thing we could do now is we could say we need to have a, um, a um, public event about it. That is a good answer. We need to have um, bring more um, uh, more speakers and uh, and and outsiders to campus to to inform us. That is a good answer to that question. But those are but there's, there are a thousand good answers to that question. The question is the real issue is how can that be coordinated? How can we move forward on it? How can we get the resources to make it all happen? How can we do old fashioned uh, organizing instead of um, how can we uh, figure out from the council of Elders and Eric, uh, how to actually uh, how to actually um, tell tell the masses what to do. The masses know what to do. The question is how to how to get folks um, in communication with each other and um, to uh, get them working together and pulling in the same direction. I think that that's the, that seems to me to be the better way to to think about it. So I agree. I, I'm like, if not now, when? I mean, this is. Um, an important set of uh, an, an important set of issues. I, going back to the secret court, nothing about the secret court could surprise me when I first read the story, and the more I've learned about the story, absolutely nothing about it surprises me at all. This was a period of rampant anti-Semitism, uh, anti-Black racism, homophobia, the whole thing. It was just one more piece of the harbor that was and um, their legacies to that particular moment that we need to address. And so I think that uh, I serve on the university's committee on Harvey and, and the legacy of slavery. And believe me, we're turning over some rocks, which you guys will hear about uh, that are gonna be very uncomfortable. And you shouldn't be surprised about any of that either. And so Harvard is a leading institution in the United States before the US Constitution. Of course, there are rocks we're gonna turn over that will make us uncomfortable about people at people of color presence in this university and what it means and, and in the life of the nation. Shouldn't be surprised, but we have to face our history. We have to. And, um, and now we have to, I, I want, I, listen, I, I want to come to this convening and be, just sit. And I want you guys to tell us what kind of future do we want? That's where I am. Let's make a different future. 
I tell my son, like, you know, dude, I thought I was done going to these marches, man. At least I can fly to a march as opposed to on a Greyhound bus at three o'clock in the morning, which I used to do and I will never do again. But if my kid is out there marching, which may happen as we all face what's happening in November, I'm going to be there. And we all have to be there and we all have to be ready to think about the future. Uh, but you can make the future. We, we, we have to. And I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm engaging. I'm, 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 I'm sort of saying things that sound like platitudes. And I really don't mean it that way. I really mean that um, when I decided I was going to be an activist uh, many years ago, I never expected to see certain changes happen in my lifetime. And I never felt, I never thought I was going to be comfortable. We got comfortable for a moment. And then the reign of the, the new the current administration made us clear we should have never been comfortable because it's, it's not, go the forces aligned against us have not uh, retreated and they just found a different way to come at us. So we're still in the business of making change in this country and, part, and making change in this country is what's connected to making change at Harvard. Evelyn, one of the things that you were, um, um, you're hiding your lighter under a bushel for a, a little bit, and so I'm going to call you out. Um, and um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the way I'm going to call you out is that um, you've been very, very hard-nosed about the fact that in the COVID crisis, that, one, that not only do, are we seeing um, shocking overrepresentation of, for one thing, our country has. Um, failed the population, and our government has failed the white po uh, the population, and our government has failed the population because their government, um, the, and I mean the Trump administration, is a white supremacist government. It's yeah. a white supremacist, misogynist, woman hating, immigrant hating, um, and neo fascist government. And, I'm, and I know that the, uh, people don't like it to be said that easily, but that is the truth. Let's yeah. name that and claim it, and and understand what we have to do, what we have to yeah. get done. But the other thing that you have said is that part of what is going on in the COVID crisis is about the systematic um, uh, lack of servicing and lack of humanity towards the health needs of people of color and, by the way, immigrants and working class folks, period. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think that we have failed on, and I, I feel irritated by people who are younger than me um, quite often, and I try to get over it because, come on, is that the Black community, the um, Latino community, the Native community, and the immigrant community in the United States um, took it in the neck around HIV AIDS. Absolutely. Massive amounts of people. And still, that. and still. And are still done. And so part of what bothers me is that we've done so little work of reclaiming that recent history of resistance to that. Yes. And so you want to know how to struggle against COVID? Why don't you ask the people who have struggled, know a little bit about struggling against pandemics when you live in a white supremacist country? That's a bunch of folks who are still surviving. And so part of what I think in terms of at Harvard and elsewhere, um, producing structures that will allow us to survive is in fact to get uh, um, serious about reclaiming the histories of resistance that have uh, been going on, period, but that um, uh, the, the, the people who have most of the power and most of the wealth in the country don't even have never really recognized. Um, but we can't in our own, um, uh, we can't be ethical persons and we can't be um, people um, trying to make a difference if we do that too, if we refuse to actually. Um, recuperate what we know to be very, very powerful modes in which we actually had grand success in terms of actually keeping people up and uh, up and alive. Yeah. Um, and so I don't. It bothers me that you see so little of that activism. Now, don't get me wrong. And I'm I'm seeing your praise card. I know you have been out front to say exactly this point. Um, and I'm not trying to um, guilt trip anybody, but we need more of that type of work of of stuff that happened literally 20 years ago. How yeah. have we forgotten all of that? Yes. That bothers yeah. me, including people um, who um, were associated with, uh, with Harvard, for example, Marlon Riggs, yeah. you know, whom I met on the campus of exactly. Harvard. Exactly, exactly. You know, um, and the, um, it's a shame that we don't 
we have to put more attention into even retaining our, our most recent history and a history that's that, that's not hidden. It's very much out there. We know about. It. You know, I, I I completely agree with you, and I I do think that um, this sort of absence of historical knowledge. I am now. I was just writing about this this afternoon. The absence of historical knowledge of what has happened to African American communities, other uh, brown and indigenous communities, and immigrant communities in this country, the constant forgetting mm -hmm. is is the problem we have to challenge. Mm -hmm. And um, because people are going, oh my goodness, uh, who who knew that African Americans would be disproportionately in fact uh, uh, impacted by COVID? Well, I knew it. Everybody knew it. Because, because what happened in the pandemic of 1918 influenza? What happened to smallpox epidemics in the 19th century? What happened to all, tuberculosis outbreaks? What the, all of those, in all of those, African Americans and poor people of color suffer disproportionately to white populations. This is not news. The pandemic of COVID just revealed it in ways that many people had never thought about. And the, and the lockdown put some of that information in front of them in ways that had not been in front of people before. But the absence of knowledge and, the, and, and now, and I think the challenge we face now following that is when there's a vaccine and there may be one soon, how will we equitably distribute that to save people's lives? Who's gonna be first in line? Who's gonna be last in line? and whose children are gonna be valued over others. These are things that are coming before us in the next few months. Mm -hmm. And it's about lives. It's about people's lives, but it's gonna be in that context of, you know, now in, I was in a meeting at the CDC last week and they said, oh, there's so much distrust about black people, among black people about the medical system, you think? Why do you think that? And so how are we going to convince them that we're really going to be on their side this time? I said, oh, it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot to convince people that you're on our side. But we, those of us sitting in this institution, ought to be once as well yelling at people who are decision makers, many of whom are Harvard alums, to say, you will not do this in ways that are going to disenfranchise, disenfranchise our people because we're here. And that's what I mean about speaking up. You know, uh, people who, certain people go to Harvard, this becomes something that makes them powerful in the world. Well, it gives us power in the world too. So we ought to be out there fighting this fight. And we are ha going to have to fight that fight. I am serious, in the next six months, we're going to be talking about whose life is going to be saved are these vaccines and who's are going to be put on the margins. It, mm -hmm. And, and if, if all you guys listening, everybody here doesn't think about that and how you use your voice as an alum or, or a person who's involved in this institution, in this institution, we should, our ancestors should be really pissed off. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just want to add um, like two cents. I think it's imperative to um, add on what Professor Hammond has said, but like, the responsibility of holding Harvard accountable, even to hold the next administration accountable if Trump, hopefully, you know, we, we're gonna do all we can to make sure that he's not back, right? But it will be um, our responsibility to also hold the next administration accountable for this very same question about the distribution um, and equity therein, inside of um, giving out the passing out vaccines. And, you know, we, we have a traumatic history with 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 medicine in 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 the same ways that you just mentioned, right? So we have to take this seriously as well. Oh my gosh! Just what an absolute banger of a conversation! I I feel like this conversation could go on and on, but unfortunately, we are approaching the end of our time. I'm sorry, Camille. I have to interrupt. It's time for you to come out as a southerner now. <laughs> It is time for me to come out. Of I am from Memphis, Tennessee, which in my opinion is, All right. <laughs> it is home to the greatest barbecue in the nation and the Academy Award winning um, rap group 3-6 Mafia, which I think is <laughs> very, very important. Um, <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity, Professor Reed Um 
I want to close with some positivity. And this is how I've been closing, you know, most of my conversations that I've had over Zoom um, in this moment. What's bringing you joy? What's making you feel good? And what is giving you hope for the future? Um, I'll go first. Uh, Eric, hearing him this afternoon, um, this evening was wonderful. Uh, watching his beautiful face, listening to his incredible words. I have a spark of joy. I'm going to take it with me uh, in the next few days. Can I respond in the same way? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> I am so inspired by um, all three of you just being in your presence and in this company. Um, I just, I, I was telling my boss the other day, like I was realizing who else was on this panel and she was like, oh no, no, don't be nervous. And I literally like have just been thinking about how influential each of you are. And I just, I have such a great respect. So just even to be able to be on a panel like this is just, is life giving and so many things like this happening. So thank you so much for, for allowing me to be here and, and wonderful, just you all are just amazing. And I also have to add my dear, fellow comrade who I have never even said how absolutely thrilled I little did a little dance in my house when he came to Harvard and I was hoping he wouldn't decide to stay in New York and have more fun uh, I'm so glad he came to join us and that gives me joy as well in this particular moment thank you so much Evelyn now I now I have to say <laughs> you guys may are the ones that give me joy uh look I'll say this, um, that um, when I got the, um, the um, invitation to be part of this panel, I totally didn't want to do it because, you know, I have lots of stuff to do. Uh, and I did it because I thought uh, this is service and this is what one does to make a difference in the world. I will say, um, Camille, to answer your question and to you, Eric, and to you, Evelyn, that I'm, um, I'm, I'm all like a little choked up and happy, you know, uh, and very, very, uh, I feel it's a real privilege to have had this conversation with you. If I can add one other thing, um, I, um, I, you know, I'm uh, 55 and I feel like I'm hmm, 25 years older than the average person that I saw on the streets during the, um, during the, during the mini marches that um, I saw and witnessed around George Floyd and generally about racial justice in the United States. I was and am so damn proud. And um, I, don't, um, I don't believe the hype of, um, of, oh, those are just, you know, kids and that, you know, they'll be gone tomorrow. Well, to hell with that. Anybody who does any activity is trying to help us move forward. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they're from. I'm super proud. And I think I'm the only person in the United States today who is full of hope. I'm expecting that we're on the uh, verge of something fantastic and wonderful. Um, and I know, I know that you know that you're on the, you're about to, something's about to happen when the wall is right in front of your face. What did you expect? That that's the place at which the resistance is, uh, is most severe is the, is the, is the moment at which that which is beyond that resistance is most valuable. So let's not forget that. Um, I um, have said very clearly what my beliefs are about this administration, I'm very clearly about um, aspects of the society that, I, I, um, that disturb me greatly. However, I believe that when monsters die, they die with a lot of bitterness and bile, but monsters do die. And you know that we have seen in our history, our hundreds of years, we've seen in our history um, uh, things fall that, that our ancestors could never have imagined would have fallen. Um, and we have no, if I, I won't speak to you, I have no right to be despairing. What a perfect closing note. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists for being here. My heart feels extraordinarily full. Um, and Professor Hammonds, I really take your point. We are, we're gonna get this convening going and we are gonna have more gatherings like this because it should not take a hundred years. Um, and I also want us to create some joy in this space as well and think about the future. 
Um, thank you to all of our attendees for engaging in this incredible conversation. We hope to see you at the next Secret Court 100 event. Um, and watch your email. We will be sending you um, the recording of the event, um, which should also include the chat transcript, because I know that that was popping off too. All right. Thank you, Camille. Incredible, wonderful questions. Incredible panel. Thank you, guys. Amazing job. Thank you, Camille. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. You are wonderful. Big kiss and hugs. Donut <laughs> <laughs> party. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good, Good night. night.